Coming up on Tech News Today, is Egypt blocking Twitter? We're going to take a look at some very interesting footage. Also, how to get a cheap Verizon iPhone. And a copyright law troll just gives up. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, January 25th, 2011. Tech News Today is brought to you by Ford, introducing the all-new 2012 Ford Focus Electric with voice-activated sync and My Ford Touch, featuring gas-free power, zero CO2 emissions, and battery management technology that lets you go the distance. Learn more at focuselectricpower.com. And by MailRoute.info. MailRoute is a secure hosted service that provides enterprise-grade virus and spam filtering to companies of any size. Try it right now absolutely free at MailRoute.info. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Jason Howell. And joining us from across the continent is Clayton Morris of ClaytonMorris.com. You also know him <laughs> from Fox and & Friends and, and other That's shows right. like that. Yeah, I think Fox & Friends is probably a little bit more famous than ClaytonMorris.com. I was trying to give ClaytonMorris.com top billing, though. Let's see if it can take down O'Reilly. Yeah. See if ClaytonMorris.com can take down O'Reilly tonight. That's right. Also joining us, uh, Nate Langson. Uh, Nate is editor of Wired.co.uk and, uh, like Clayton, friend of the show. Hey, it's very, very late here. Please don't crush my blog again this time. Last time I was on, my blog crashed. So let's, let's Your personal blog or Wired? Yeah, because I no Wired was fine. My personal blog, um, I think on the show, the last time I was on, it was the first time I mentioned it anywhere. And a whole lot of people went and looked at it and it crashed. It could have been coincidence, but I like to think that it was, you know, the, the, the huge pull of seeing the nonsense I'd written that day. We TNT'd it. <laughs> <laughs> you did. Yeah, it was explosive. Right. Actually, that's, that's a, a, better than slash dotted or, or boing boinged or twittered or digged. TNT yeah. actually has some dynamite. It actually means something. Yeah, like Wiley e. Coyote style. Let's uh, let's start off with uh, the rumor out that the iPhone five, that would be the next version of the iPhone, and the iPad two will come with near field communication built in. Uh, this, according to analyst Richard Dougherty of the Envisioneering Group, who actually is one of the analysts that tends not to say crazy things, who tends to to have a pretty good uh, record at, at calling these sorts of things. He cites engineers who are working on hardware for Apple's latest project, asserting that uh, NFC capabilities are apparently built into both the iPhone and the iPad, which would allow you to make contactless payments via near-field communication, which is all the rage. It's built into the Nexus S. Everybody's talking about NFC. I'm not sure that there are a lot of places in the United States to use it, to make payments yet are there other are places in the uk nate um not many um the the biggest thing i guess would be uh the oyster system which is what uh, we use in the london tube network so you have like a little card it's kind of like a credit card size thing with a chip in it and uh, you just walk through the barriers and you sort of swipe this thing over and it deducts money from a balance kind of like a prepaid card uh, that's the sort of the most large the largest scale rollout we've got i think mcdonald's are going to start rolling it out uh, in the uk at some point next year or maybe later this year but um, I think this makes a whole lot of sense for the iPhone uh, massively, you know, with it having 3G and, uh, you know, Wi-Fi and things like that. Um, but the analyst who made this report or, or certainly made the prediction um, also specified the iPad, which I think makes significantly less sense because why would you pull an iPad out, you know, to, to make a payment? I mean, I, I, I get it if you were sort of walking into a store and it could detect you were there, but um, I, I think it makes less sense than it does on the you know, the next iPhone. Yeah, and I think it, it's a little unwieldy to be able to, you're in line at a Starbucks, you've got your coat on and you're reaching into your pocket to try to pull out an iPad. I also think it's a change of theory. It's a change of thought for a lot of people too. Whenever I hand over my iPhone to, you know, at Starbucks to the attendant, uh, to the barista, uh, she never knows what to do with it. She always gives me this weird look, like she doesn't know what I'm, what I'm supposed to do with your phone. You're handing it to me, so I'm gonna scan your barcode. I mean, if it's yeah, set up I like they have at McDonald's, like the Arch card, you walk up, you tap it, and you can go, and you can grab your quarter pounder and hit the road. 
You know, they have the same thing here in uh, in the in the Visa cards we got here. They have little uh, NFC chips in them, and you can. It's called PayWave, and the idea is that you sort of just wave it over the card machine, and it's all automatic. There's no PIN number, no signing, no nothing. It's just deducted straight away. And even when I give my card and say I want to use my PayWave, they sort of have this glazed look of like horrific confusion on the face, like what are you what are you trying to do with this card? You know, right. and I think if you introduce an <laughs> iPhone into that equation. It's going nowhere. Um, but I think Apple's in a really good position to do this as well because um, with, you know, all the credit cards they've got on file, you know, they could set themselves up as some kind of payment processor for all shops anywhere that has this system. And I think that is a huge opportunity. And Chicago has a very similar, uh, like your tube system. Chicago actually are, is already using that near field communication set up in Chicago. Of course, we won't get it in New York probably for 10 years. Is it in San Francisco? Yeah, there's a, uh, a, a thing called TransLink, uh, but I don't think it's NFC. I think it's RFID, but the, wow. the idea is the same. You wave a card over the, the reader, and it allows you to go on the BART train, allows you to go on the AC transit buses, the Muni buses. Uh, it's, it's cross all of the different regional transportation issues, and it's very, it's very convenient because you just carry that one card with you instead of having to, oh, I've got a pass for the BART, but then I have a different uh, month pass for the Muni, and it's, you know, it's, it's really nice to have that. And, I, and, and one of the things you ran into in the old days when you had to have a magnetic strip is your phone would demagnetize the right. strip all the time, right. and then you'd have to go and hand it in. So the idea of your phone actually being the way you pay is, is, is a good idea. I'm all for that. Look let me ask you, I'm curious, Tom, is there, has there been any discussion whether or not this would be open to third party? I mean, it would be interesting if there was a mint style application that had access to that, to that chip and, you know, maybe like a one password style approach. So I don't need to, if I go to the Dwayne Reed to the pharmacy, I don't have to have, I don't have to launch 80 different apps. Uh, I'm curious if there's a a one sort of catch-all approach that would be able to take advantage of that technology. Yeah, there is. It's called iTunes. <laughs> That's a, I, 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 I don't know about you, Nate, but I'm betting that this thing is going to be working through iTunes. And apps can take advantage of it the way they can take advantage of the GPS. But all those charges are going to go through your iTunes account and mm. Apple's going to have their cut. Kill me now. Seriously. <laughs> no more with the iTunes. Thanks. You have enough. You know, they'll just tack on another 10 megs to the download size. It's no big deal. <laughs> well, to be honest, what's 10 megs when you're talking about 7 gigs as a download, you know? Yeah. What's 10 megs between friends? Right. Also out uh, today, Verizon uh, made, an, made a statement earlier today to the Wall Street Journal saying that they would have a $30 unlimited data plan for the iPhone when it comes to Verizon. And then by the end of the day, had backed off a little and said... Well, for a limited time, we'll have a $30 unlimited data plan. After that, we're going to be just like AT&T, and we're going to put tiers on this. Uh, wait, when they said $30 unlimited, you could hear the stampede of people coming from AT&T uh, saying, you know what, great, I've got these limits at AT&T, I want to get unlimited. But now that they've said, well, you've got to wait, Clayton, do you think, like somebody who's in a contract uh, who can't jump right away, might now decide, well, I'll just stay with AT&T. I don't know. I mean, if, they, if they're going to have this window open for a limited time, you know, come on down. It's like a Christmas sale. Come on, come on down. You've got a limited time to take advantage of this unlimited data plan. That may cause someone to pause, especially if they're on AT&T with a uh, two gigabyte capped data plan. Um, and they know that they want to make that jump over to the Verizon iPhone. I think it's interesting, though. It's a very similar approach to what AT&T did with the iPad, right? They rolled out that unlimited data plan. We heard at the press conferences. We, you know, I spoke to AT&T right after. Afterward, I, I asked him, I said, does AT, you know, does unlimited mean unlimited? And AT&T was, oh, yes, unlimited means unlimited. And then about 15, 16 days later, they pulled the unlimited data plan altogether, and they were, they were putting the two gigabyte cap on there. So uh, at least Verizon's being forthcoming by admitting it up front, though. We're also seeing Verizon uh, allowing a uh, trade-in pro. Or they already have a trade-in program, but really pushing a trade-in program, uh, saying if you bought a phone between November 26th and January 10th, you will be eligible for the Verizon trade-in program, even if it's an AT&T iPhone. In fact, they say they'll give you $200 for a smartphone or $75 for a feature phone. Uh, the iPhone 4 from AT&T will get you $212 credit. If you want to take your iPhone 4 over to Verizon, that that will compel some people to come over, I think. Uh, 
That's pretty good. We don't have anything like that in the UK, from what I know. Why, 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 what are they, why are they, you know, giving this money? Are they taking the phones and recycling them or something? Yeah, they, deal? yeah they probably are. They may be reselling them or pushing them out to a third party that resells them for them, uh, doing some mm -hmm. recycling. But, the yeah, the idea is I just got you to abandon AT&T and switch your contract mm -hmm. to Verizon. It's the same phone, all the same data on it. You're hardly going to notice, and you just got better service. At least that's the argument Verizon's going to make. Maybe they're taking it. Maybe Verizon has a deal now with Gazelle.com, and they're taking all those phones and they're funneling them over to Gazelle. Yeah, exactly. So, somebody like that, I'm sure, is is who's, yeah. who's behind this. Absolutely. Also, uh, finally, Verizon uh, had their earnings report this morning. Uh, said they have added 872,000 contract customers during the last quarter of 2010, bringing it to a total of 102.2 million wireless customers. Profits rose to 93 cents per share from 22 per share during the same quarter a year ago, even though revenue fell 2.6%. They were able to squeeze more profits out of it. So the carriers are not hurting as much as maybe they would hope you would think they are. Uh, i tell you something. You've got, you've got more people on Verizon than Britain has human beings. That's amazing. <laughs> Wait, by Britain, uh, now Britain, you mean Scotland, Wales, and England, right? England and, uh, and, and Ireland, yeah. Oh, you're, um, you're including Northern Ireland in there. All right. I'm including Northern Ireland in that too. So the United um, Kingdom. Northern United Ireland Kingdom. not being part of Britain. I'm Certainly. just trying to avoid the emails. You know my country better than I do. That's, that's quite impressive. <laughs> Um, but what, what interests me is that um, you've got, you know, 872,000 new people joining Verizon just before Verizon gets the iPhone. So that's kind of, I'm guessing, 870, maybe 1,000 people who are now regretting joining Verizon when they did because they're now stuck in probably like a two-year contract, uh, you know, on some Android phone, uh, which is probably very good, but not maybe the iPhone they were holding out for. I think that's interesting. It's also worth noting, too, that AT&T saw a record number of iPhone activations in the last quarter, um, even knowing, and you know, AT&T was very upfront with me in saying that, look, this is even with people knowing that an iPhone on Verizon was coming, and yet we saw a record number of activations in our last quarter. So either people weren't that uh, ready to make the jump, uh, or they just wanted an iPhone now and they couldn't wait an extra few months on the, on the, on the notion that there might be a Verizon iPhone. We will see very shortly. They're coming out, uh, was it February 7th? Is that when you can actually order them in stores? I think February 3rd is the pre-order date, something like that. Yeah, and then well, February 10th. It, well, February 10th you... is in stores, okay. Yeah, yeah. Egypt uh, is undergoing some protests right now. A lot of people are comparing this to the Tunisian protests. Uh, I think there's less likelihood of a change in government in Egypt than there was in Tunisia, but you know, this isn't a political show, so I'm not, I'm, I'm not 100% about that. But what is going on is uh, accusations that Twitter has been blocked in Egypt. Uh, Tunisia regularly blocked internet things, so when they blocked Twitter, it wasn't a big surprise. Uh, Egypt also does block... Uh, Egypt normally slows down access to things if they're, if they're worried about access to the Internet rather than just blocking. Uh, but Caroline McCarthy over at CNET has a really interesting article about what may be going on. Twitter is only speaking about this through their Twitter account, Twitter Global PR, which seems to have launched today. They are referring people to a site called Herdict Web, H-E-R-D-I-C-T Web, uh, run by the Harvard University Berkman Center for Internet and Society. Jonathan Zatrain uh, is the person who keeps an eye on that. Herdict Web uh, is, uh, says they've had, as of 11 a.m. this morning, seven reports of Twitter inaccessibility in Egypt that have been logged. Seven reports sounds like it might just be random outages or, or like we said, a slowdown. Yeah, and it seems that... Yeah, the, the Mubarak administration trying to, you know, quell dissident voices, and it doesn't seem that it's just focused on Twitter. It seems that there are these other these other websites. And, in fact, the Washington Post, you know, you're starting to see a real shift, though, I think, in the media with this type of reporting, because I remember being on the air when the Iranian um, the Iranian uh, issue was uh, unfolding uh, two years ago during the election cycle. And of course, all the information we were trying to get out of there was coming through Twitter. And you saw the government trying to clamp down on the, on the Twitter feed, but that was where the real information was coming out. Today, the Washington Post has up even a translator um, uh, right on their website that's enabling them to translate these, uh, these hashtag uh, January 25th tweets that are coming out of Egypt right now. So the mainstream media is at least starting to pay attention to this on a broader basis.
The Nod Tanangi from New Jersey uh, wrote in and sent us some great links to various things going on, videos about the protests. Uh, the president and his family have fled to the UK. That's President Mubarak. Twitter, uh, he also talks about Twitter being blocked in Egypt, but people using proxies to get around the block. Uh, he says they are using Twitter, YouTube, Ustream, and Facebook to share the message. In fact, some of the YouTube videos have the default uploaded from my Android phone. Iran, Tunisia, Lebanon, and now Egypt have all used social media and the Internet to spread their message of obtaining freedom, although not all have been successful yet. I think this is a powerful theme. It will build up so young people take a greater importance in their local politics and maybe even help young Americans understand global issues. He goes on to extol the virtues of, of social media in this sort of thing. But it's, it, it is worldwide, and, and you can follow events in a way that was unthinkable. And interestingly, Tom, too, there's this... Um People are writing about this right now on the Washington Post website, and as it's being translated, there's apparently, as people are talking about this Tiananmen Square moment, Egypt has had, is right. now having its Tiananmen Square moment, and do we have, I don't know, we had it, but there apparently is video circulating now of a guy in front of an armored truck, uh, in front of a tank or an armored vehicle of some kind that's... Um, it's causing quite a, a bit of stir right now, and people are, are sharing this. So it's pretty interesting to watch this unfold in real time. Yeah, yeah I, there's there's pictures all over the net on a lot of these stories of, of that that moment uh, with someone facing down a tank. Uh, so the, you know this this is a big political event. Uh, I'm not going to try to wrap our heads around what is actually happening, and what's likely to happen there. Uh, but but there is a tech angle to this, like in all of these situations in Iran, in Tunisia, uh, now in Egypt, and and, and lots of other uh, areas. And, uh, and and the idea that you can block it, but you can't stop it. It's that that hacker mentality that allows people to continue to communicate. All right, let's take a break and thank our sponsors, Ford, makers of the Ford Focus Electric and sponsors of Tech News Today. Ford introduces the all-new 2012 Ford Focus Electric this month with voice-activated sync and my Ford Touch. It is a car without a gas engine, powered by a lithium-ion battery, high voltage capacity, so you don't need the gas engine. It still does the regenerative braking like a hybrid, so when you're braking, it's recharging the battery, but it's also... Recharged by plugging it into an electric outlet, 120-volt outlet or a 240-volt outlet, uh, which enables it to, to do all the things you need to do. Get around town, do your errands, commute to work and back. Uh, more than enough driving power for that between charges. And if you charge it overnight, it's probably or well, maybe cheaper than operating it with gasoline. Uh, it, it depends on the electrical rates and the gas rates in your area, but electricity is often cheaper than gasoline. The all-new 2012 Ford Focus Electric features sync with My Ford Touch, responds to voice commands and touch controls for entertainment, climate control, phone, navigation, and battery management, which you don't need in a in a lot of other cars, but you do need that with uh, the Sync with uh, with the Ford Focus Electric, and Sync provides it for you. You can easily make calls, play music, and manage your battery all by speaking one of 10,000 voice commands or seamlessly switching from voice to touch when your car is at rest. Stay connected while keeping your eyes on the road and your hands on the wheel. To learn more, visit FocusElectricPower.com. And we thank Ford for supporting our coverage of tech news on Tech News Today. Google Voice is finally for real uh, with the number porting. We mentioned earlier there was a test going on. Uh, they have now launched it. 20 bucks in the United States uh, for existing users to port your main line of service over. You going to do this, Clayton? Um, I don't know. I'm a little scared. I, I can't explain what it is. Maybe you guys can help walk me through, like Dr. Phil style, why I don't need to be scared. But um, why, you know, why, have, are, why are you scared, Clayton? Well, I have... You're fat because you want to be fat. You're scared because um, you want to be scared of phone numbers. I have my, you know, I have my Google Voice phone number, and I use it maybe 10% of the time. Um, I just don't know if I want it ported over. I'm worried about taking that leap and relying on, uh, you know, the, the the translation, the translation software, having my voicemails read to me, which you know is spotty at best. I feel like I'm jumping into uh, that sort of system. And, you know, I'm on the iPhone, too, and visual voicemail for me, you know, I don't know how it's all going to tie together, and it sort of scares me a little bit. I mean, I've had problems, and certainly there's been outages and, and problems before uh, moving over completely. So I don't know. Are you guys going to do this? I, you know, I'm not. Uh, I, I was wanting this for a long time because I would like to have the number that is known uh, be my one number for everything. But what I've run into 
is call quality is degraded when it goes through Google Voice. I tried mm -hmm. to use Google Voice, the number I have for Google Voice, as a main number, and I ran into big problems when I was calling in for radio interviews. Now, this is not something people are normally going to have a problem with, but they were saying, you know what, your, your call quality is, is breaking up, it's dropping out, it's just, it's, it's not as good. And it didn't matter if I was on my landline or on my cell phone, it, it just wasn't working. Whereas if they called directly to the cell phone or directly to the landline, it worked fine. So I, I think there is a quality problem when something is forwarded from Google Voice to the phone. A lot of people may not that may not matter for them but if but if it does at all you probably don't want you probably want to have a google voice number that you use for certain things but still have a backup number you know that that you want direct and i think i think i'm going to keep my cell phone number as as a cell phone number nate nate if this comes to the uk will you do it uh mm, i'm skeptical i i think probably not but the problem that I have is is that I have one phone in my in my in my world. I have one phone. Uh, I have a landline that I I technically pay for because it's all part of my cable and my fiber uh, subscription. But uh, I don't actually have a phone plugged into it, so I have just the one phone. So the one number for me kind of works fine. Um, I haven't seen an advantage to Google Voice, but I kind of think that if we had it, I would be testing it. And if I tested it, I'd probably find that I wanted to keep using it based on what I've heard from you guys in the, in the States. Um, but I, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, I don't even have vis visual voicemail on my iPhone because of the contract that I'm on. It doesn't, it doesn't technically support it. Um, so I'm kind of still stuck in the old, the dark ages, you know, regular, regular cell phones. Um, so I don't know. I want to try it. Certainly. I really, really want to try it. I wish they'd just get that right together and bring it here, but yeah. um, it's kind of a big deal. I think, though, just going back to Clayton's point about porting the number and, and nervousness over that, I, I kind of, though, assume that you can port it back. I mean, I don't know how it works with you guys there, but here you can, uh, we have, you know, a PAC code, a PAC code that is kind of like an industry standard, and you can take it from one carrier to the next and back again, and you own that number. No network can hold a ransom over it. Um, and so I kind of think that you could move it back from Google if you decide you don't like it and want to move back to a cell phone. Um, maybe that's not the case. I don't know. Maybe yeah. you can no, tell me. You can. Yeah. You can move it around, but it's just a hassle. It's not a very easy process. Yeah. Mm. Well, I'd certainly like to try it. Also, uh, Google bought something called SayNow today, uh, which has made its name with conference callings. For for instance, giving celebrities like Miley Cyrus or the Jonas Brothers uh, a phone number fans could call and hear customized messages, kind of an answering service type thing, but on the Internet. Uh, so I, I, I assume we'll see more conference calling and message service type of uh, functionality rolled into Google Voice soon. The lawyer... Uh, Mr. Andrew Crossley for ACS Law. Followers of this show know him well. Uh, he has been uh, after those file sharers. He's going to bring them to justice. And he has now withdrawn from pursuing alleged illegal file sharers in the middle of a court case, citing criminal attacks and bomb threats as the reasons. Nate, this is uh, this is going on in the UK. Is is he yeah. really is he really in danger? Uh, I think he probably is actually. Um, to be honest, I don't. I don't know how you know threats are one thing. Actual acts of violence and bodily harm is is very different. You know, threats are obviously just usually to get people to stop doing stuff. Um, but the th the interesting thing about ACS law is that Crossley is the only. Uh, registered solicitor within this organization. He's the main stakeholder in the firm, I believe. It's basically him and I think maybe a couple of assistants or something like that. It's his gig. All of these letters, all of these claims are basically coming from him, from his desk. So when you're in this position and you're getting bomb threats and you're getting death threats and all this kind of stuff and you've got a family and it's just you and the business behind what you're doing is kind of crumbling perhaps because of all the... Um, the controversy over the leaked uh, personal data, the email breach that happened, I think back in September, maybe October last year. Um, you know, not to play devil's advocate too much, but I can at least see where he's coming from in terms of wanting to try and take a step back. Um, but what I can't defend is the fact that basically they've gone, uh, he's gone very, very far. He's really deep in this. And sometimes you do have to kind of be accountable for everything that's happened up until a certain point. But I certainly get why he's trying to pull out based on these threats. It's not a company. He is the company, basically. Um, and that's very different from, you know, being a lawyer at, you know, a massive firm like, say, you know, IBM or, or something like that, where you've got 
hundreds of lawyers, you know, potentially. Um, and he has not been well received at court. Uh, Judge Burse QC, who's handling the case, said, I want to tell you, I am not happy. I am getting the impression with every twist and turn since I started looking at these cases that there is a desire to avoid any judicial scrutiny. And the judge even points out the cost of defending one of these suits is reckoned to be 10,000 pounds. And he points out you can get away with asking for 500 or 1,000 pounds and be paid on most occasions without any effort of having to be made to really establish guilt. It is straightforward legal blackmail. At least that's what Lord mm. Lucas of Crudwell and Dingwall accused Crossley of earlier, and, and the, the House of Lords being the highest court. That's remarkable. So, I mean, just being able to settle for 500 bucks instead of having to go to court to defend yourself for $10,000 so that you're defending yourself against 500 bucks. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it is brilliant. And I have to say, we were chatting in the pre-show a little bit about a friend of mine who's, um, uh, he's, uh, he was an 80s rocker, a fairly popular one at that, and I won't give up names, but uh, a group, uh, an ambulance chasing group, just like this guy, basically Brad approached Michaels. him. <laughs> yeah, Brett Michaels. Um, and uh, he, he basically said, they said to him, hey, look, we've managed to get hundreds of thousands of dollars from people who have been illegally using music or sharing music um, from other artists of your genre and, uh, and of your ilk. Uh, we, we're going to, you don't have to do anything. We're going to go after these guys and we're going to find out. We're going to look in the dark recesses of the Internet and find out where these people are sharing music. Uh, and we're going to get you the money and the royalties that you're due. And he just had a slimy feeling about it. And he was basically like, uh, OK, but basically, you know, they're, they're ambulance chasers. They're going to get the money for him and they're going to take, what, 65, 70 percent of it. Yeah, I, I, that's exactly what's going on. And it's it's funny to hear this story where someone's like, I, OK, I know nothing about this. I'm not agreeing to it. Don't you worry about it. We'll right. we'll take care of this. But we needed to note that we had notified you uh, so that we can get money out of you later. Yeah, and they're not even working for the RIAA. I mean, they're doing this independently. And I suppose then there's no there's no money being you know brokered from the RIAA. It's not like they're giving it to them or going right to the artist. They're saying, hey, we'll cut out the middleman here. In fact, I think the RIAA is kind of saying, look, you guys need to stop this. This is not the procedure we're taking. They're trying to put pressure on ISPs and the government to come in. They've, they've sort of moved far away from the idea of suing individuals and suing fans. They realize that that, that doesn't work either. Let's move on to Facebook's new ad scheme called Sponsored Stories. The way this works, you, yes, you, if you are a Facebook user, are now a spokesperson for anything you happen to post about, uh, especially if you're checking in at a location uh, or liking a page. It can now show up as an ad on your friends' pages. So, for instance, I check in at Pete's Coffee. There could now be a an ad on on Nate or Clayton's page saying Tom's having a latte at Pete's Coffee because that's what I checked in and wrote. And there'll be a Pete's logo, and you can click through and go to the Pete's site, and there'll be a picture of me right by that. <laughs> you with a big thumbs up, and Tom supports Pete's Coffee. Uh, it sounds. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, the argument, of course, is look, you've signed up for Facebook. You've liked something, and if you're out at a KFC and you like KFC, uh, and KFC sees that, yeah, uh, you know, should they have access to the person that says they like their brand? Um, and then, but it's not going right in your news feed, right? As far as I understand, it, it's it's going off to the side and those it, side. It goes both ads. places. It, it'll go in your news feed oh. as it would normally, but then it'll also be highlighted as an ad over on the right side. That's yeah, and terrible. let me guess, this isn't opt in. This is opt out, isn't it? I have to tell Facebook I don't want this. I, I don't guessing. even know. Can you say you don't I, want it at all? I don't think you don't can think opt you have out a choice. of this. this because it's only going to your friends, and it's only taking what you already wrote, and the terms of service of Facebook are that they can use anything you write on Facebook inside of Facebook. So hmm. that's terrible. So if I'm having a conversation with someone about going to see True Grit, uh, the movie studio could buy if I give them a favorable review, could buy my True Grit comment. Well, that's Post interesting. That's interesting that you say favorable review. Ah. Because what they're buying is, you mentioned True Grit, or, or what they're buying is you checked in at the at the movie theater for True Grit. What you write in the I'm checking in is not checked as far as I know. Ah. Uh. 
So you're just checking uh, in. But I mean, within the places check in, I could say saw true grit. It was fantastic. So are, are these just bots looking at these things? Or, you, or you could say saw true grit. What a piece of crap. Don't anybody see <laughs> that? Sponsored by True Grit. The best part is if they would pay for that, that would be brilliant. Yeah. Well, now, and, and, and they made this clear. They said, look, the, check, the check-ins may not be for everybody. If you're worried, if you're sensitive to your brand being derided, then you might want to just do likes because you can't add any text to a like, and that's the safer way to go. But, yeah, I can imagine a lot of people uh, rebelling against this by posting some pretty nasty stuff. All right, uh, let's finish up with Metro PCS really quickly. Uh, they are piling on to the Verizon lawsuit, filing their own lawsuit against the FCC to stop net neutrality regulations. Uh, and part of the reason is probably the new Metro PCS plans. $40 gets you unlimited talk, texting, web browsing, and YouTube access, right? That sounds great. So why would you pay for the $50 plan? Well, the $50 plan gives you international and premium text message, mobile instant messaging, corporate email, one gigabyte of additional data access. Wait, but I thought the data access was unlimited. And the Metro Studio video service? Aha. Web browsing does not include video. So the $40 unlimited plan doesn't cover video only covers YouTube. The $50 plan gives you the Metro Studio video service on top of it. And the $60 plan gives you Metro Studio, YouTube, and 18 video on demand channels. But don't try to stream any other video because that's not included. <laughs> this is tiered, this is tiered internet. This is what Metro PCS wants to do. The only thing that confuses me about this is doesn't seem to be in violation of the FCC's toothless guidelines anyway. Because those said we're not really going to, you know, put any limits on what you can do with a wireless account. Right. So how why how can they even file a lawsuit here? I mean, what's what grounds do they stand on with this? They're doing I mean, this, if, they're doing the same thing Verizon did, saying FCC doesn't have the right to regulate. We don't care what the regulations are. They shouldn't do it at all. <laughs> so even though they have nothing to do with us, even though they have nothing to do with uh, with a wireless carrier, we're still going to pile on in this lawsuit. Yeah. Exactly. And when That's they're filing great. their own, you think they could have just waited and let Verizon finish their lawsuit, but they're actually filing their own lawsuit separately, which is costly. It's going to cost them some money. All right, let's take a break and thank our list. Our thank our listeners. Let's take a break and thank our listeners. Actually, that's a good yeah, idea. Yeah, there's no reason we shouldn't. <clears throat> no. This episode is brought to you by our listeners, <laughs> like you and the people who watch too, the the viewers. Uh, it also just coincidentally happens to be brought to you by MailRoute at MailRoute.info. And I think that Twit listeners probably would like MailRoute because it gets rid of spam. And if you go to MailRoute.info, you get 10% off the life of your account. So what, what happens is you edit your MX record if you host your own domain name, and then all the mail goes through MailRoute. They strip out all the spam and viruses, send it back to you clean. You get the good stuff only, not the bad stuff. 99% of the stuff that comes to AceDetect at Subrillion.com is crap. MailRoute takes it away. And all I get is the good stuff. So check it out, mailroute.info. And, and let me emphasize again, thank you for listening. And it's smart people like you that make the show what it is. Time for the news views. <laughs> Round one of Huawei's battle with Motorola goes to... Huawei, the Korean company. An Illinois federal district court granted the Chinese manufacturer a temporary restraining order that prevents Motorola Solutions from disclosing confidential information about Huawei's technology to Nokia Siemens Networks, which has announced plans to buy Motorola's wireless network business. Motorola still expects the sale to go through, however. Aaron Sorkin's movie about Facebook's Mark Zuckerberg received eight Academy Award nominations this morning. Uh, the movie was nominated for Best Picture. Jesse Eisenberg was nominated for playing Zuckerberg himself. Uh, David Fincher for Best Director and Aaron Sorkin for Adapted Screenplay. Uh, the other four nominations were for Cinematography, Film Editing, Original Score, and Sound Mixing. Oh, that's my favorite category, sound mixing. And the man who defeated Grokster in court is uh, U.S. President Barack Obama's choice for Solicitor General, former Recording Industry Association of America lawyer uh, Donald Varelli Jr. may become the man who defends the government before the Supreme Mouse. Court. Uh, the f files a friend of court briefs in cases and determines which cases it would bring to the Supreme Court for review. So I wonder exactly what cases he'll be picking. 
CNET obtained a copy of the U.S. Department of Justice's position on mandatory data retention, which states Congress should strike a more appropriate balance between privacy and police concerns. The position will reportedly be announced at the House of Representatives hearings tomorrow. Scope of the proposed law is unclear, with guesses including a two-year data retention requirement or heavy regulation on any Wi-Fi connection, including an open one. Uh, Google said in a blog post that it expects to exceed its 2007 hiring record when the company added more than 6,000 people to its ranks. Last year, Google grew by 4,500 employees, which was its second largest year for headcount growth. Aaron Alan Eustace, Google's vice president of engineering and research, wrote, we're looking for top talent across the board and around the globe, and we'll hire as many smart, creative people as we can. Amazon may be looking to become the next web van without the going bust part. Amazon Tote is a test operation in Seattle that offers customers a free weekly delivery on a specified day and doesn't require a minimum order size. Earlier, the Amazon Tote website said the program, quote, will be expanding soon. However, that notice was removed later on Monday, and Amazon spokesperson, uh, spokeswoman declined to comment on that. Amazon's also getting into spam. Amazon launched a cloud-based email service today that it says is aimed at bulk transactional email services. Amazon calls it Simple Email Service, and it provides the infrastructure needed to send big batches of email by way of an API rather than setting up internal mail servers or contracting with third parties. Amazon says it will ensure the emails comply with anti-spamming laws, however. A single universal memory technology that combines the speed of DRAM with the non vol uh, Volatility, in fact, and density of flash memory was recently invented at North Carolina State University, according to researchers. The new memory technology, which uses a double floating gate field effect transistor, would potentially enable computer makers to build machines that boot up almost instantly and drastically cut energy consumption. I like that. And William James Adams Jr., better known as Will I Am of the popular music group Black Eyed Peas, was named Intel's new director of creative innovation, the chipmaker said on Tuesday. This follows HP's employment of Dr. Dre and Polaroid's hiring of Lady Gaga in moves to include musical artists and tech companies uh, to make beautiful musical tech things. Um, will I Am will work with uh, Intel on developing new technologies, music, and in technology advocacy. It'll be. I'd love to be at one of those board meetings. You know who I think we should hire? Lady Gaga. <laughs> it's going to turn this company around. Polaroid will be saved. Lady, the floor is yours. Yes, exactly. Um, sorry for uh, interrupting you in the middle uh, earlier there, Clayton. I, I was, I was trying to point out to uh, Jason that there was a, uh, a, a tool tip coming up in the middle of someone's forehead. <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot I like, my ah. mic. I forgot my mic was on. All right, uh, bookshop in Portland is doing a deal that you should take advantage of if you can buy a cheap Kindle on eBay. They will tr give you a trade in for your Kindle for the value of it in books. So you bring in a hundred thirty nine dollar Kindle or a hundred eighty nine dollar Kindle, you can take away a hundred thirty nine to a hundred eighty nine dollars worth of books. So then they, they, they must also have a partnership with gazelle.com. Yes, I guess so. Uh, <laughs> Seven so Verizon. The, uh, the bookstore is Mike, or it's Microcosm Publishing. Uh, it's not a bookstore, uh, I, I don't think. It sounds like it's actually a publisher, although a red, the register is calling it a bookshop. Uh, most of the store's books are priced in the $2 to $6 range, so you might be carrying your books out in a fleet of wheelbarrows, enthuses the retailer. I don't know if Microcosm Publishing just carries, like, a wide variety of stuff or if it's limited or if they print it themselves. Uh, so far, only one person has taken them up on the offer. Yeah, the press that they're getting probably is more valuable than, than what they're actually going to do with these Kindles. NPR, the, yeah, a few weeks ago on their book podcast, had an interesting story about these small niche uh, bookshops that are, you know, like at least here in New York City, are actually doing surprisingly well. They're focused on community. They're having reading events. Uh, there's a great bookshop here in Manhattan. Uh, it's a, a travel bookstore uh, called Idlewild, I believe, in lower Manhattan. Great. You know, there's nowhere else I'm going to go for a great travel bookshop. I'm going to go to that. They've got fantastic books that are centered around a specific topic or genre, and they seem to be working. And so the, the, it seems to be how some of these smaller bookshops are surviving in the age of ebooks 
And I don't know if they actually were reporting too that some of these booksellers, and obviously with the advent of Google Books, some of these small bookshops are really excited about uh, being able to push their own books through Google Books uh, at their own at their own stores. Which yeah. I don't know how, you know, I don't know how excited I am about that going down to a bookshop and through that little bookseller buying one of their eBooks. I don't know how. Again, it seems to me a little bit gimmicky, but. Nate, Nate, is this uh, is this something that you, do you believe as uh, as uh, the publisher in in Portland believes that this is soulless faux literary for us to use a Kindle? Um, <laughs> no, not really. I mean, I, I'm still I haven't been brought around to the Kindle way of thinking yet. I've used uh, you know a lot of ebook readers and and you know reviewed a lot of them, but you know I still buy books. I haven't bought a Kindle of my own yet. Um, I don't like reading anything on the iPad. I still like buying books. So, you know, I kind of like the idea of just people still buying books. Uh, the problem that I would have with this is that, um, you know, I could trade my Kindle in uh, with these guys and get like a brand new book, or I could sell the Kindle and I could just buy a whole load of pre-owned books for about two pounds or, you know, three or four dollars or something on Amazon pre-owned. That's where I buy all of my books. I don't remember the last book or CD I bought full price. So, yeah. Um, you know, it's it, it's a weird one. I, I I think like Clayton says, the, the the free press is probably more valuable to them than anything. Yeah, um, and we just help them with that. So there you go. Hope you hope you appreciate it. <laughs> On to the calendar. Yahoo had their earnings report today. It looked good, uh, although they did lay off 150 people today right before their earnings report. But because of laying off people, the roughly 750 employees they laid off during the last quarter, they were able to report a 104% increase in net income, 14% increase in sales of display ads, net sales of $1.2 billion, down 4% compared to the same period a year ago. Uh, and it's the ninth consecutive quarter of declining revenue. But that still beat analyst estimates. Analysts thought they were going to decline even more. Uh, and their earnings per share also beat analyst estimates at 24 cents per share. Libra Office 3.3 released today. If you don't know, Libra Office, uh, L-I-B-R-E Office, is the fork of Open Office that happened after Oracle took over management of the Open Office project. A lot of uh, developers decided they didn't want to work under the yoke of Oracle. Uh, there were some issues with the way it was being managed, so they forked it. They forked the open source project, and this is the first official release from that new fork. Do, you guys, do either of you guys play with Open Office or Libra Office in this case? No, not I, recommend it to, I recommend it to people to install on a PC um, if they need a, a word processor, because I think for, you know, for anyone who's just writing documents and making things bold and centering text, OpenOffice is a great suite of apps. You know, I, I live and work professionally with Google Docs, so, you know, I could easily move to OpenOffice. So I, I support it. Um, but, you know, I don't really use it myself, if I'm honest. Verizon is offering BlackBerry 6 upgrades for Bold 9650 and the Curve 3G. That starts at 8 p.m. tonight. Also, News Corp's daily iPad newspaper is going to launch, quote, in the next few weeks, according to James Murdoch. We were expecting an announcement earlier this month, but we didn't get one. It was delayed. Facebook credits will be mandatory for paying for things within Facebook apps starting July 1st. That means those Zynga bucks you have will still be good, but you'll have to use Facebook credits to buy more Zynga bucks or whatever app you're using. And finally, T-Mobile releases the Streak 7 and the Galaxy S 4G in February, and we might see the LG G Slate in late March, according to leaks reported by Engadget. On to the voicemail 260-TNT show. Martin has a comment on the homebrew projects that we were talking about yesterday regarding Windows Phone 7. AT&T crew, this is Martin from Tampa, Florida. Regarding the Microsoft embracing the Windows Phone 7 hackers, uh, the question was, you know, why not, why not unlock it completely? And uh, I think the answer to that is Microsoft knows that jailbreaking is never going to be mainstream and there's really no downside to supporting these guys while they're not mainstream. Um, the real question will come when these guys come up with a, a hack or a homebrew that enables something like tethering or some other function that the carriers don't agree with. And we'll see at that point how open Microsoft is to the homebrew. Just my thoughts. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, there's got to be a limit at some point with what these hackers want to do versus what Microsoft wants to embrace, don't you think? Yeah, it's yeah, a delicate balance. 
it, they're, they're in a good position though to to let the hackers uh you know do what they want i think it's great publicity for them if nothing else and really it, it's not actually harming anyone so let them let them get on with it mark from pasadena writes in to tnt at twit.tv i listen to the podcast uh, so I can't tell if you were putting on rose-colored glasses when you're talking about targeted advertising. But he has a uh, he has a dystopian future to paint for us. He says, in a world where targeted advertising is perfected and everyone knows it, you will be mortified when anyone else sees your ads because, and do I really need to say this, advertising targets your weaknesses. Jock itch, yeast infection, <laughs> debt problems, memory loss, sexual fetish. It'll all play out there on your screen. Imagine a room full of people watching TV over your, your Roku at a party a few years in the future, and someone says, oh, my God, whose ads are these? And you look, and it's the end of a Viagra commercial leading into a Depends commercial, and they're your ads, Tom Merritt. <laughs> <laughs> But then all of your friends will know. They'll say, "Hey, these these we all know that Tom Tom has a bit of a problem, and he wears Depends, and uh, and they'll feel they'll feel grateful that uh, these ads are these ads are uh, on target." I mean, I I get annoyed when I see ads well, one day that are fantastic. You know, they're right on. I might have purchased something on. Uh, you know, might have purchased a history book, and then I get history-related specific things from the History Channel that pop up on my Facebook page. But, or but don't you already feel weird when you're watching a program and they're, uh, you know, marketing a, a bunch of uh, household cleaning products and uh, work-from-home things, and you start to realize, <laughs> oh, my gosh, am I in that demo now? Am I, am, am I one of those people? Yeah. I do, but I'll tell, tell you what annoys me more, though, is being on Facebook and they see my... I've changed this now, but they saw my status as male and single. And so I got ads for, you know, single women in your area, this, that, and the other, all this kind of stuff. And I think, this is so bad, I'm changing what's on Facebook just so I don't see these ads, you know? Uh, <laughs> it was a conscious decision I had to make just to change the ads. You know, it was either do I say I'm married or do I say I'm gay? And I thought, well, less of two evils, I just won't say anything. Um, you know, well, why don't you just say you're married and gay, and then you get some really awesome ads. You know what? I've never tried that. Yeah. I've really never tried that. Depends on what state you're in. You're going to be careful with that. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, Clayton Morris, thank you so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure having you on. I really appreciate uh, having you along with us today. Let folks know where they can find what you do. Sure. Um, you can go to ClaytonMorris.com. Also, we had a new podcast out today where we talk about all things nerdy. We talk about uh, Dark Knight Rises, uh, a new Spider-Man video from the set of Spider-Man, the next film. Uh, my podcast, The Grizzly Bear Egg Cafe. I would love everyone to come over and check that out. That just the new episode landed today. Well, it's, it's really great having you on the show, Clayton. Also, oh, Nate, uh, pleasure having you on as well. Two, two of the smartest people in technology journalism. I, I, I couldn't be happier with today's show. Uh, let people know about what you're doing at Wired. Uh, well, Wired, um, hopefully some of you guys have heard of Wired. We do a lot of tech stuff. Uh, we've recently been uh, uh, dipping our toe into the world of podcasting. So we've only done eight or nine episodes so far. But if you are missing a subscription and want to you know, hear more of this voice, then... Uh, Go to wider.kdk slash podcast and, uh, and check out what we're doing over there and uh, drop some suggestions. Uh, and, of course, uh, I'm on Twitter, and I'm almost past the 3,000 follower mark. So if you ever wanted to follow a guy, go and do that. Uh, I'm uh, at Nate Langson. Um, spelling's on the screen. Follow or, Nate you know. Langson, N-A-T-E-L-A-N-X-O-N. You can find us at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us TNT at twit.tv or give us a call, 260-TNT-SHOW. We'll see you tomorrow.